let's jump into the first session of the day where we're going to be discussing how to create human-centered leaders and managers in 2023 and beyond. Welcome everyone. How are you all? Good, good, good. Delighted yeah. to be here. So nice to see you all again, uh, smiling. I couldn't think of a better way to start off future work. So I appreciate you all being with us. I think it's tradition, Sanyin, that I come with you to the first question, as always. So we can't break that. Sanyin, you know, why are current leadership development programs not helping to prepare our workforce and the leaders of tomorrow for the future of work? Mm. So I've seen different types of leader development programs and different companies, depending on their context, have uh, different combinations. And so while those are good, we can always do better, right? Because the, the world is constantly evolving. So I like to approach that question from three different angles. One is content, two is modality of delivery, and then three is duration. So when it comes to content, what I find is often our frameworks of leadership is still very focused on the individual. But now we need to move to the idea of team, the relational. So my work on superpowers is really about how do we connect with each other more? How do we interpret each other's actions uh, in a more fruitful way? And then how do we help others? Um, how do we give interpretive clues to others? Uh, so the content, uh, I think, when you look at the relationship um, type of focus, shifting towards that and looking at human-centered aspects such as wisdom. I mean, think about it. When's the last time we've promoted someone because they are wise? When is the last time we ever see wisdom in a job description? So that's just a taste of the type of content which we can dive into. The second is modality of delivery. We are living in a multi-generational workforce now. Now, in my generation, I love things that are via text written, right? Because I can scroll through. Um, but another generation, say Gen Z, who I see in a lot of my students and also some of the alums that I work with as they're moving forward, um, for them, it's about 15 second, 15 second, um, or sorry, one minute or two minute videos or audios, or it would be like, here's a quote. So we gotta be mindful of, how they consume the information, not just what information we want to put out. I mean, it goes back to a core aspect of leadership. We have to know our audience. We have to know our followers and respond to them in a way that they need, right? And then the third aspect is duration. Uh, we don't do leadership develop. We, as human beings, we don't grow just because we go to a class and then it's done. It's a one-week class. I mean, we can get insights from it, but requires development requires practice and habit formation. So the more that leader development programs can share, say, an insight, um, and here's the skill set and the mindset, but then here's the practice and then the reflection on it. So it becomes really a part of who you are um, in context. That duration is important. So content, modality of delivery, and duration. That's uh, how I would approach it. Love that, Sanyin. Thank you for kicking us off. I just want to jump in and say, you know, Sanyin, I think it's so interesting that you talk about when did we last promote somebody who was wise, you know, and you, you put these programs together and you say, okay, so we can get fundamentals through basic programs. But the fact that business is changing so quickly, you, you need that mentor, you need that, that guide. You know, I, I love when we talk about diversity and so on. There was a, a friend of mine said, you know, I do a lot of uh, consulting with uh, startups and and we've got all these really brilliant young people in the room in tech and so on. And he goes, where are the gray hairs? Which I really appreciated. Well, the hairs in particular. But the point is, is that where do we have the old souls in the room? And, and this is where I think the work that Ace Up is doing is really important, that you've got like a, a guide, you've got a coach that you can go to and say, okay, I've got the basics here, but this is kind of weird. This Have you had this experience? How do I handle that relationship? So you've got the modalities of the short videos, you've got the courses you can go through, but then you've got that person that you can call or you can text that's your confidant, that's your guide. And, and you know, Will, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. I mean, your your life is to is to be that guide. How important is that now than ever, right? Yeah, absolutely. First of all, the first minutes make me remember how much I, I love listening to you, uh, Chester and um, and Sanyin so much. So, <laughs> so excited for me to, to be here with you today. Uh, I, I, I totally agree with what you said, Chester, and um, something that really resonated in what Sanyin shared is um, the leadership 
development has changed because the nature of leadership has changed profoundly. And the complexity of leadership today has nothing to do with what was leadership and in even what is a great what what it means to be a great manager a few years ago. Uh, the hybrid world of work, uh, the, the globalization, the diversity uh, in terms of generation, generation, ethnicities, and, and gender. It is a much more complex uh, world that we're navigating today. And um, when you were talking about uh, a human-centered uh, approach to leadership, Sanin, um, it's very true that in a world that is becoming more and more digital, it's more important than ever to be human. And we see actually how the boundaries, even in the remote world of work, between work and life are getting blurry and how as leaders we need to be able to really uh, be human, more human than ever in an environment that someone is a bit dehumanized because of digitalization. Um, and in terms of the modalities of, of what seems to work in, in this uh, new world of work uh, when, when we think about leadership development. Definitely the complexity of leadership means that more personalization is needed. And while the role of digital learning uh, is key to scale this program, the role of mentoring and coaching and even sponsoring in bringing this human and bringing this personalization in leadership development is absolutely critical to help uh, leaders navigate uh, this, uh, this complexity. And Josephine, actually, I, I was uh, uh, reading about you and excited to get with, uh, on this panel with you today. And I, I'd be very curious to hear how this notion of being more human uh, in leadership development uh, resonates. I know you become yeah. chief people officer in the midst of the pandemics. Right. How, how that experience has been. Yeah, oh, it's been an amazing experience. And, and to watch all of this happening, these changes in leadership that you're mentioning, Will, over the course of the pandemic, you really get to differentiate um, what makes leaders effective, right? And that notion of being resilient, of being able to face crisis and uh, be cool under pressure was so important during that time, right? Um, and we really wanted to elevate those skills in all of our leaders. And so the way we trained everyone, as, as Sanyan was saying around modalities, the way we trained everyone became very, very important, especially when you're training from remote distances, right? Um, but I will say, just to touch on Sanyan's point around experiential learning and whether or not you can do that when you're remote, right? I think it's all about kind of steeping the, the values around the skills of leadership in, in everything, every facet of the employee experience, right? So if you do that, all of a sudden it becomes ubiquitous in the ecosystem of the organization, such that every phase, the onboarding phase with, with new hires, right? So you're hiring in new leaders, you're onboarding them, you wanna do 30, 60, 90 day check-ins with them, and you wanna set expectations in the beginning to say, here's what we expect from you. We are, we are a culture that values, and these are our actual values at XPO, respect inclusion, innovation, entrepreneurialism, and then we have safety uh, in our industry. That's very important. Less about the soft skills, but notice that the other four values are all about these soft skills relating to leadership, right? In order to develop this respectful culture, you have to have gratitude. You have to know how to say thank you for all the accomplishments, the incrementals, even the small accomplishments that lead to the bigger ones. Are we saying thank you enough to people? You can say thank you via an email. You can say thank you via a text. You can say thank you on a Zoom in a meeting with, with all your teammates, right? Um, so we have to build it into the actual behavior so that they become habit forming and they become organic and natural. So if you don't infuse the values around these skills, these leadership skills in everything you do in every part of the process of employee experience, I, I don't like using the word process, but you know, in, in everything that we do around employees, onboarding them, how we evaluate their performance, whether or not they can get a promotion to the next level, whether or not they are on the succession plan for whatever it is they're aiming for as they ladder up in their careers, 
we really have to establish with all of our employees, if you want to make it to that next level, if you want to be on that succession plan, if you want to get promoted, these are the skills we need to see you demonstrating day to day in everything that you do, right? And, and a lot of times we focus on competencies, right? We focus on the hard technical skills, but what about these softer elements that really are the bedrock of leadership? Because those are the things that it's hard to just teach. It's exactly what Sanyan said. You don't just go to a course and expect that that course is just going to revolutionize your day to day. It has to be something that you take back, you form it as a habit, and you remind yourself every day, did I say thank you? Did I, did I include all these diverse perspectives in this meeting that I just held, right? Did I, was I not inclusive of a certain person? You know, this person was quiet. This one wasn't evaluated, right? And, and let it be okay for you to... Um, really go back and say, if I if I look at what I did, what were the facets that I, I maybe missed on and what are the ones that I can emphasize more the next time around? So continue to focus on that self-learning and self-reinforcement from those courses that you take. Bring it back, make it experiential and make sure everyone is observing what you're doing and invite the feedback from the people who work for you as a leader. So we have a lot of, we do many engagement surveys here. We actually do them quarterly um, here at XPO because we value the voice of the employee. We want them to tell us, you know, do you feel like you trust leadership? Um, what's, if you could rate your relationship with your manager on a scale of one to 10, what would it be, right? Because it tells us where we might have gaps, where we might be missing something. And then we can go back and fix that. We can implement solutions to that. We can be more self-conscious of these things as a, as a broader organization. So, Thank um, you so learning, much, self-learning. Sure. For sharing these, Josephine, there, is, there are two things you shared that resonate uh, so strongly. First of all, you really talked about leadership development as a process. Yes. And to get back to what Sainin and, and Chester was, were saying, this is why a, a, one, a one-off program cannot work because there needs to be a continuous commitment to behavioral change with recurring feedback. Right. Uh, uh, you know, insights from your peers, your managers, your environments to raise your self-awareness and understand where is the gap between when you are in self-mastery and the, the, the skills that you need to, 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 to better master, to thrive in your environment. Um, and something else that you, um, that you mentioned uh, extremely well is uh, how we can really design leadership excellence at scale. And it's actually a, a real framework to engineer into an organization where it needs to, to start from the company's mission, uh, purpose, where this is rooted into leadership principles and values, you relate to these. And from these values, we're going to be able to identify these competencies, soft skills. Uh, there are also technical competencies for some role, but uh, both aspects are very important. And, and also something we, we, we do at ASAP, and uh, let me know if it resonates, is we also identify very specific behaviors, what we call micro behaviors, be, behind each one of these competencies. Because to some extent, the culture is an organization is a sum of behaviors that are uh, uh, done consistently every day. And, and being able to actually make it very concrete, what are the change we want to see in the workplace uh, if we want uh, uh, our, our people to, to embrace the leadership excellence uh, that we want to have in our organization? Uh, and I think the, the, this, um, this framework you articulated to engineer leadership excellence at scale is uh, is really important to to understand, uh, Harvey. I, I know you have been uh, coaching uh, emerging leaders for quite a long time. Uh, to get back to this, you know, uh, how do we engineer leadership excellence at scale? What, what have you learned about about this? <clears throat> First, I love the insights, uh, and and I hope everyone's tuning in. Uh, secondly, one of the things I'd like to say, I think one of the, the best and, and most important mistakes, if I can use that language that we make, is sort of over-indexing on individual leader development. Look, the individual is, is a powerful unit, uh, right, of, of sort of productivity and, and, and wisdom and, and intellect. But I think one of the great mistakes we make is, is again, over-emphasizing the journey of the individual leader to the detriment of the team. And so if you know, John Katzenbach's sort of definition of teams is true, that teams are the central unit of performance in the organization. Then we'd be wise to help people, A, understand how to lead and manage a team and to allow their leadership development to be of service to the team's performance so the team can deliver 
on its mission in the context of what it's been carved out to do for the company. And then it also helps us sort of better situate the individual's leader development journey, uh, journey, right? So as a person on this team, how am I honing and refining my skills that help my team be greater than the sum of our collective parts so we can actually execute the mission that the company has tasked us to execute? And then you're also able to tap into experiential learning and leader development. Because now every skill that I'm learning and applying fits in the context of my team, is helping us win. And if our mission is very clear, our purpose is clear, we can actually help the company execute its mission. And so we're able to address a number of things when we really focus on team leader development and helping people sort of better understand how to thrive in that context. I also love the fact that, listen, you know, the world is changing. You know, we, we talk about this notion of a complex and continuous change. And, and so if change is the norm, then perhaps it's wise for us to begin to think about the extent to which we need to cultivate a, a culture of learning agility. Uh, now, my friends, uh, Dave Hoff and, and Warner Burke have sort of defined learning agility as the ability to learn quickly from experience and apply it during moments of uncertainty. And so imagine if we have teams that are very learning agile. We're also rewarding then the individual as well to really focus on, again, what they can do to help their team succeed. And I think if we can do more of that, we can address some of the longstanding issues with leadership development. You know, Harvey, I want to jump in on that. And and then I'll pass it to you, Sanyan, because I know you've got a lot to to say about this. (laughs) You know, the, the, the idea about team to me is so important. And, you know, Josephine, you talked about soft skills and, and I, I know we term into soft skills, but those soft skills are the hard skills as far as I'm concerned, because you're dealing with people, right? And people are, are hard, but Harvey, I love this idea. We say we over index on the leader and we forget to, to bring the leader along and say, by the way, get your team to buy in. You know, it's not all about you. It really is about the team. And and to Josephine's point about gratitude, you know, uh, we have a very simple thing that we, we talk about all the time. We say, look, on your team, are you cheering for each other? You know, this this very human need. I need to be supported. And, and if I'm not cheering for you, why? Why am I not cheering for you? And are you cheering for each other? So this, this soft skill about, hey, uh, you know, individually, uh, the leader can be very smart, but collectively, you can be Einstein. You know, if you get that culture of, you know, humanity and 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 that we're talking about today. But I love this idea of it's it's the leader, yes, it's also the team. And if the team is cheering for each other and it's feels they feel safe to cheer for each other and you've got that emotion, boy, that really takes you forward. And having said that, Sunyan, I know that you've got a brilliant I I, I take more notes when Sunyan talks than anybody, by the way. I just want to show you. So there we go. <laughs> Esther, I value your wisdom so much. And it's like one of the big things I'm learning from listening to all of you is also the language. Like Harvey, what you said about team leader development is still just individual leader development. And then Will, like the idea of how do we design, you know, leadership excellence at scale and Josephine, the intentionality. I mean, as I was listening to you talk, it was one, the dynamism of the process that it's not fixed, but it's evolving with that constant feedback loop to what's working, what, how is a, how is the world changing the context? And then also um, the intentionality around it. And Josephine, what you had said about, you know, let's talk about these values, but then let's also put them in context of every single phase of from the onboarding all the way to exit. And then being able to distill down, what does this, value mean expressed in behavior at this um, stage, at this, uh, at the manager stage, at the entry level stage, at the EVP stage, I think that clarity gives a lot of psychological security because then there's no, there's no question around, around it. But I want to go back to this idea of team, because I think that is something, what Harvey said, we don't spend enough time thinking about teams or talking about teams and then distilling down, what does that actually mean in how we relate to each other? Um, I recently heard, uh, read about a word, there's shade and Freude, um, but then there's also Freud and Freude, which is cheering for each other. <laughs> and, psych- and science has told us, um, thank you at the Chester for raising this idea of cheering for each other, that that actually builds stronger relationships, right? So we can have an all-star team but that doesn't guarantee that we have a championship team. 
and we can have a championship team without all-star players. And how is, why is that? It's because of the chemistry and the trust. So I want to pose a simple idea to the group um, based from the world of sports. In basketball, in soccer, in sports, we record assists, right? It's not only um, uh, celebrating the person who makes the dunk or scores, but we actually record who is the person passing the ball or the puck to the person making the score. In hockey, we record not only the first assist, but also the second assist. So if I, you know, knock the puck over to Will and then Will sends it over to Chester um, and Chester scores, that's in our records, Will in my record and in Will's record. That's a simple behavior of just recording assists. Mm -hmm. Do we do that in the corporate world? <laughs> and why not? Brilliant. In sports, we know it's team. And what how many times there's a assist? lot of frustration there as well, right? I think we've all been in companies where we're like, wait a minute, I was part of that, but that only that person was recognized <laughs> for, for that as well. It's such a good analogy. You know, a quick little thing, because I'm a big hockey fan. In fact, this is my team. That was for you, Chester. I brought in the hockey for you. <laughs> Being Canadian, it's it's not a sport, it's a religion. My, my point is, in, in hockey, what I love about the assist, the first, second assist, and the goal, when you look at point totals in the NHL, they all are equal, which I, which I love. You get a point for scoring a goal. You also get a point for being the first assist and the second assist. So I, I love that. Do we do that in business? Uh, th that's brilliant. You made my day making a hockey reference on this panel. <laughs> He's going to use that in every meeting now, Zanyan. <laughs> <It's gonna be> <laughs> you know, if, if I could chime in here, it's my hope that, that the audience is really tuning in. I mean, so much of human behavior hangs on this notion of incentive. And this is why in organizations, A, we, we continue to see individuals compete against one another as opposed to helping support one another achieve the collective goal, because the rewards mostly favor the individual. Mm -hmm. And it's it's completely underwhelming, right? So we, 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 we work very, very hard to acquire top talent, onboard them hopefully well, identify career pathways that they can take, put them in the context of a team, hopefully the leader is a strong performing leader, but if we pay attention to science and research, then we know uh, based on what I guess sort of the, the base rate of managerial competence that about 50% of our leaders are underperforming. So you either have a good or a poor experience being on, you know, in a team and you can, you can put forth your best effort, but the rewards mostly favor this sort of individual. But if we were to reward teams, perhaps we would see more teaming behaviors. Mm -hmm. So people are just following the incentives. This is why I think if, if, you know, if I'm in the seat of a CHRO today, Hopefully, I'm beginning to reimagine the kind of culture we do want to shape and begin to help our C-suite colleagues pivot the reward structure as well to teams. And then you can also create a culture of peer coaching in that process. So we're learning how to coach, how to be with, how to celebrate, how to challenge one another. So we're all moving in the right direction. And just, just on this notion of sports, I've got to share this. I, I had not planned to do this, but the Wall Street Journal <laughs> did just highlight Philadelphia as the center of the sports universe. I just wanted to highlight that. Hello from Philadelphia. <laughs> but continue, <laughs> Chris. Oh, you just wanted to say that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, something I really appreciate you saying is uh, the privilege that, that I have that I know many of you have to do the job we do, which is coaching. It, it is um, an, an incredible uh, privilege, I think, to be able to um, bring this personalization in the development journey of, of people. And, and something that we see clearly with coaching is uh, individualization is, is essential in um, really enabling leadership transformation. But we don't need more individualization. And indeed, what we see in our times is um, the importance, especially in a hybrid world of work, to 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 enable these connections, uh, enable these alignments with the team and ultimately the organization. And for me, 
uh, my apologies. For me, there is nothing more um, human, actually, to, yes, start from the individual, but really also think about how we move from the individual to collective transformation. Uh, and when what we refer to at ASAP as human ITO transformation, ITO standing for individuals, teams, and organization, is that to be profoundly human, uh, it's of course important to start from the individual, but it's also very important to understand the systems around this individual, the teams around this, the environment the individual is part of. And, and there is nothing profoundly human that's to enable this alignment from the team, from the individual, the teams, and ultimately, what are the common goals? What are the common goals that we're striving towards together? Um, and and I have to, to uh, uh, first of all, I'm not surprised based on the incredible work you've done with Coach K, sending in for your many sports reference today. Um, <laughs> so Chester, I, I important for me to put a light also on the incredible you do around gratefulness. You have been talking about gratefulness today. I need to say how grateful I am to be with all of you today and, and have this conversation. Um, and, you know, when I think about human-centered leadership uh, uh, and the role of, of, of gratefulness in being more human at work, especially in these times, as you said, it is so important to find ways to celebrate being together, to find ways to celebrate wins uh, at work, especially uh, in these times. So just thank you for the work you do there. It's so inspiring. And for everyone listening, that was just question one. <laughs> I, was actually, I was looking at the time thinking there's no way we're getting through six questions <laughs> right now uh, no, as well um that was did, sorry josephine did you want to jump in <laughs> yeah, I, I, did, I just wanted to touch on the point of individualization actually and how that then ties back into this team-based concept because what i've seen in my experience is that really effective leaders actually do know how to zone in and personalize and identify for each individual member of the team, what their strengths and their gaps are, such that to Harvey's exact point earlier, when you bring the whole team together and you're adding up all their contributions, the sum of the parts is greater than the whole. That's a very important thing that Harvey just said earlier, because what you're doing is you're, you're optimizing each person's development plan such that when you bring it all back together, there's huge ROI for the organization. And I don't just mean that financially. And, and of course, that's very important. But I actually mean that also from a retention perspective. Like when Sanyan was talking about it earlier, the first thought that came to my mind is, yeah, when that team is humming and they love working together, they're celebrating wins with each other, cheering for each other. Uh, then what happens is you feel like you're part of a family, you're part of a community. And the minute that that individual identifies themselves as part of a greater whole, they don't want to leave that whole. It's very difficult to extract yourself out of an environment that's welcoming and encouraging, right? That's where you want to be as a human being, really in every aspect of your life. But when you can get that in the workplace, which is where you spend the majority of your time in any given day at a minimum five days a week, probably more, <laughs> um, you know, this, that's so important, right? It's important for the stickiness and retention element that we've been all struggling with during the great resignation, as we call it. Everything we're talking about here really ties back to how do you make an organization successful? And it's when leaders know that the sum of the parts can be greater than the whole if you do this right. And it's all of this ties together in bringing organizations to the next level of optimization. Uh, Josephine, you have, your organization has been through two uh, uh, acquisitions recently, and so you're in the midst of this trans, uh, transformation in an organization that is hybrid. You have frontline workers, you also have office workers. How do you enable these team alignments in this uh, peculiar time for your company? We do so many roundtables. Well, we go out to the field, we talk to our employees, that constant feedback loop that I was talking about earlier allows us to commu communication, by the way, we haven't touched on this very much. Communication is key to bringing all of this together. So the more in touch you are with your entire employee base, especially the leadership coming from the top and going out to all the field workers, and literally we hit all of these different service centers, we must have done 
over two, 2,000, 2,500 roundtables collectively across 290 different service centers in the organization here in, in the North America part of the geography. So we are that much in touch with our employees that we're able to communicate what we believe our core values are. We're, we're able to communicate our gratitude and our respect to these employees, especially our frontline employees who worked so hard to ensure that not only the company remained intact, but remember, we're a transportation company. So none of the good you all received during the pandemic would have made it to your homes or to the next facility that it should have been transported to without our workers, right? So they were kind of heroes in all of this, and we recognize them for that. So that recognition, the appreciation, the opportunity we give employees, in my mind, if you can zone in on those, those few things, respect, appreciation, and opportunity, you will never fail. And as long as your employees feel that that's what you believe, that's your mantra, you, you show it, you demonstrate it in every aspect of their experience, like I was saying before, that's how they know, that's how they'll appreciate that this is the right place for me to be. This is a welcoming work environment, right? So it was very important to us to stay in touch, to, to be at the helm with them, not just in front of them, right? So we're with we're with our employees, we're collaborating with them. That's That, I think, is really what sets our culture apart from so many others, especially in this industry where it gets difficult. To your point, you know, the, the, the whole demographic of the population is really 85% hourly, 15% professional salary. So how do you get all of these people together and uh, ha having a common purpose, singing from the same song sheet? You know, it's you have to be in touch with everyone. Your communication channels have to be open. And going back to the notion of modality, it's not just about the modality around how you train people and how they learn, but how we communicate in general. What did we accomplish today? So in order for a driver who's on the road all day long in, in our company, this is, again, it's a transportation company, they have to be able to receive, let's say, a text alert or something that tells them that, hey, this is a great accomplishment in your service center or, you know, for the company as a whole, and you should know about it. Because now, because you belong to this greater whole, and you should know that you were a part of creating that success. So that communication channel, I think, has been the most important for us. Love that. It's, it's so interesting because <laughs> when people look at my LinkedIn profiles, a lot of people say, oh, why was you at the same company for 10 years? And yeah. me and Shane, both of us. <laughs> and it's because we love to go into work. Yeah. And it's such a weird thing because not, not, unfortunately, not many people understand how that feels. Uh, and it, and we were there to share. share it, we we loved each, uh, seeing each other succeed. You know, we were in a very much a sales organization. I remember one of our salespeople was like one deal behind hitting his target. And my entire team stayed and picked up the phone and cold called for four hours to get that mm -hmm. one person there set their deal. We bought pizza. We stayed late. We did it, and we all was so, so excited to to make to make that happen. And every time I got a recruiter give me a call and say, "Hey, Chris, here's another twenty k. Here's another thirty k. Come for work for us." We're going to give you this, 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 and this. And I was like, but you're not going to give me my team, right. you know, that I love and the people that I want to be, the people that we bring in lunch. We all know we, 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 we've met each other's families. We, we go to gym together. You know, it sounds silly. <laughs> we do all, we go for walks, you know, around, around the park at lunch together and have fun. And those are the things, right. That keep you at an organization. And I'm quite lucky that when we started HR leaders, most of those team members came with us. <laughs> so thank you if you're listening for, for trusting, but that's what, <laughs> and joining us, like Chris and Shane are gonna leave and start this company. And it was scary and it was terrifying, and, and but they all jumped on the on the bandwagon with us to, to, to make it to make it happen um, as well. And you, you can't buy that. <laughs> um, and and most men, and yeah. So I just love, I love that story you just shared, Josephine. You put it so eloquently. And it's great that you're, especially those frontline workers, I love that story and making sure that that driver gets that text saying, this is your impact, the impact that you have. Because sometimes that can go unnoticed, right? You know, my, what, what, what I'm giving to the organization, what is my why and the purpose and the connection to the business? So, yeah. Wow. No, Chris, I think you make a really important point about leadership right there. Is we, we, we build up all these leaders, we coach up all these leaders, and then you left and they followed you. That that's the biggest indicator that you're a great leader is that right, when right. you left, they followed you, right? Mm -hmm. And that's team. 
and that's team. The other thing that I was really impressed with, Josephine, and I, if you've got video on this, I'd love to see it, is a bunch of truckers singing from the same sheet. I, th- I just think that would be a, a remarkable... <laughs> <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> the truckers' right. choir. I want to see this carol. Right. Yeah, we, want, we want a Christmas carol, yeah. <laughs> that would be cool. Uh, yeah. All right. I, I feel like, we, you know, we, we that was amazing so far. I love to hear what people are saying in the chat. So uh, for the team, drop me some notes and let us know. Um, the next question we had were was for, to you, Will, you know, what was what are some of the considerations um, that people need to think about when it becomes to being a human centered leader in a hybrid or work environment? Because it's quite difficult to convey that in a virtual. Some leaders find it difficult to convey that in a virtual environment, if that makes sense, or a hybrid environment. It's hard enough. <laughs> to do it in person but then when you've got half your team remote half in the office how do you how do you do that what are some practical things yeah well some some practical things about this is um as i mentioned earlier first of all there is a this needs to be human because in this hybrid world of work uh, we see uh, uh, this increased use of digitalization in the way we communicate uh, and also this uh uh, uh, the fact that there is no really frontier between life and work. Uh, we can see on our calls uh, uh, the kids of our colleagues. Even uh, <laughs> this morning, I was on a call with my product leader and there was his little daughter behind him. And it's, it's part of the way we work now. And, and personally, I found this beautiful, but especially for young parents, uh, I'm not one yet. I know it's also a lot of added challenges around this. So we need to be able as leaders to to embrace uh, empathy to to embrace also flexibility in the way we collaborate, and at the same time, uh, we need uh, uh, to maintain a sense of deep sense of community, which is sometimes may sound paradoxical with uh, the, uh, a more flexible hybrid workplace. But there is a stronger need for community than ever. So, you know, when when Josephine was talking about having done a 2,500 round table with your company. It's incredible. Uh, what an example. What an example you're setting there. How do we keep organizing uh, this uh, uh, connection? How do we organize this meaningful connection in this hybrid world of work? And uh, the, the, the last point I, I, I talked about it uh, right before, which is uh, the importance of also to... to um, uh, look beyond yourself. Uh, while it's very important in leadership development to start with self-awareness, it, it starts there in the journey. So it's important to look within. Leadership, ultimately, it's really about the impact you have on others. And, and so what we have talked today about teams, what we have talked today about, you know, how do we drive this uh, a sense of alignment and, and, and meaning beyond the individual at the team level? And I would even say... Uh, as Peter Hawkins would say, at the team of teams, which is ultimately uh, uh, the organization. And that's also a key uh, reason why being more human-centered uh, in this uh, in this world of work is, uh, is absolutely essential. That's, you know, my, my, my uh, briefly some uh, 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 thing that comes top of mind, but I would be very curious also because I know many of you coach leaders right now and have coached leaders for the past two to three years, like... Uh, what have you seen as challenges of, of them being more human leaders? What are the challenges you see there? Sanin, I see uh, uh, I see you may want to jump in. Well, uh, Will, thank you so much for bringing the focus back on the human aspects of leadership. And I think we've been growing up, we've all been sort of you know, in media attuned to this idea of the leader as a positional title, like, oh, you become a leader only when you get to this position or when you're mm-hmm. the team captain or so forth. And we have to, we have to shift that. That's a big mindset shift because what we know to be true, especially today versus um, 10, 20 years ago, is that people don't follow positions or titles. People follow human beings. Right. And so that's a big mindset shift. Um, And one of, but that said, one of the coupling that one of the challenges I see with the authentic leaders that I work with, have the privilege to work with is they think, oh, okay, I'm CEO, like their first time CEO. Um, 
uh, I'm still me, right? And they, they focus so much about being human, but coupled with that is you still have the positional power. So your mm -hmm. words have 10 times more weight because you have the title CEO attached to it. And so it's it's being that self-awareness is being aware of both of those. The, I have to show up as human being, but I have to be even more mindful about my expressions. Um, I, could, I could have the flat tire on the way to work. And I come in with a scowl and people are thinking, oh my gosh, everything's going to pots. <laughs> right? yeah. So what you say, so that one word, I love what Chester's focus on gratitude because when you're in that positional that position of power, you don't really, you think, oh, I'm just saying thank you, it was me. That thank you has 10 times more weight to it. Mm. So how are you going to leverage that? And you can leverage that at scale. And then the stories people tell when you highlight as a leader, like this story at the front line, like what Josephine, that simple text to that um, truck driver, he's going to tell his friends, mm -hmm. other workers. And mm -hmm. that story then becomes part of your company's living culture. Right. It's so interesting saying, because people always ask me like, well, Chester, you asked me in the past, what was your favorite leadership moment? And I said to you that every time I used to get a sale, my CEO would come down from the top floor and shake my hand. Mm -hmm. And he did it every, every deal for, 10 years wow. he would, and to every single employee he come down shake your hand and for me that meant more than the deal right because that seeing the whole floor see you get your hand shaken and congratulate for the deal and then that's it but it was just one, no matter how senior you're in the business or even if you was on day one he would do it uh, andy if you're listening and it was something that well, i when i became a manager i, I started doing with my team and it, and you're right the weight of the fact that the ceo came and did that Sanya, and to your point, was like so powerful to me that that meant I used to get excited knowing my deal was coming in because <laughs> I know I was going to get a, get get yeah. the gratitude get the gratitude from my CEO. <laughs> one one thing really quick, and this comes back to what Harvey's saying, is it's all about the incentive. Get your incentives right, and you know, Sanya and I, I love my new mantra is going to be: "There's no goal without an assist." Right, and that's oh, why the assists. Oh, yeah. Trade, <laughs> someone's going to trade out that in the chat. You, Chester, you, shouldn't have said it. you shouldn't have said that, Chester. Someone in the chat's trademarking that right now. <laughs> that's going to be my new bumper sticker right next to my other car is a Zamboni. You know, yeah, there's no it. goal without an assist. So, okay. yeah, a brilliant conversation. I know we're running out of time, but I, I, I want to express what what Will said. This the gratitude for this amazing group. I mean, so many good ideas. I've got two pages of notes and, and the whole thing. And I want to leave you with one cool little thing that you could all take today when it comes to gratitude and joy. There was a study done that said when you smile, certain things fire in your brain that cheer you up. A fake smile does the same thing. So if you're in a bad mood, just smile. Now, if you can't bring yourself to smile, take a pencil, put it in your mouth. And bite down. It makes you smile. <laughs> I'm telling you, great it's a job. great trick and it will cheer you great. up. And that's my story. And I'm sticking to it. Uh, I, 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 I'm being told off that I have to wrap up. I don't want to. <laughs> if, I'm, if I'm being honest uh, as well. And I'm so sorry that I have to leave everyone. But thank you so much. What an amazing way to kick off the summit. I appreciate all of you. It's always joy. Um, if you haven't walked away from a smile from this session, I don't know what you've been listening to. 